Nier Automata is an absolute masterpiece. Having never played the Nier series until just recently, I'd spent the past 7 years only hearing about other people's experiences with the game. And now that I've reached the end, I can say with absolute certainty that everything anyone has ever said about the game is true. From the themes of its narrative, to the story's structure, to even how it blends its gameplay systems into the story, Nier Automata is an impressive production from start to finish. And today, I'd like to spend some time talking about it. In this video, I'll not only be retelling the story of Nier Automata so that you understand what was going on, but I'll also be critiquing it along the way, sharing my thoughts on whether or not a specific part of the story was handled well in my eyes. We'll also be going into quite a few philosophical discussions about various topics due to the game's subject matter. As always, feel free to check out any of my other videos which are similar in style to this video but on a variety of games and series. Like the video if you enjoy, and subscribe if you're new for more content like this. And as always, let's get started. Nier Automata's intro starts incredibly fast, not even wasting a minute of time before immediately throwing the player into the thick of it. The first mission is light on the story, but we're only just getting started. From what we are given, we are part of a large group of soldiers dedicated to killing the enemy right in front of us. Based on the designs of each group, it seems like we play as the humans while our enemies are robots and machines. Which means that the game is setting up a typical robots take over the world kind of plot, but that couldn't be further from the truth, and I'll circle back to that later. The main character of this game, and the one we'll be playing as throughout most of its runtime, needs no introduction, but in case you do need it, this is your hot type B number 2, better known as 2B. Alongside 2B is another person named 9S, who together are going to take down the Goliath class machine that's located at this facility. What the intro of Automata does well is plant seeds into the player's mind as to how the people within the game interact with the world. 2B comes off as a very professional and by the books kind of character, refusing to waste time on idle chatter unless it has something to do with the mission, whereas 9S is the complete opposite, spending precious mission time talking about himself and his fascination with the machines that they're killing. Eventually, after some gameplay encounters, they come across the hulking beast that they're meant to take down. Due to its sheer size, the duo has to get creative, hacking its lopped off arm so they could use it as a weapon, as well as employing the assistance of their flight units. 9S is injured in the fight, which prompts 2B to find him, only for the player to discover that 9S is not human, but rather a robot. In fact, 2B herself is also a robot, as right after this, the duo is cornered by more Goliath-class machines, leaving them no other option but to detonate the black boxes located in their body. This creates a miniature-sized nuke destroying the Goliath along with them in the blast. Fortunately, the next mission will pick up right after this with both of them at their base, called the Bunker, seemingly not injured in the blast. That's because they backed up their memories stored in the current body so they could access them later when they went to another body. Except 9S didn't have enough time to back up his, so while 2B's memories remained, the last memory of 9S is when we first meet him at the beginning of the level. All things considered, Nier Automata starts off quite well, from a gameplay perspective at least. As I said, the story is quite light here in the opening moments and for good reason, but the gameplay was able to keep me entertained all throughout. One aspect of it that I did find quite interesting was how the game never forgets that it is a game. Nier Automata often switches camera angles during certain parts of the level, and they behave like those styles would in any other game, whether that's a top-down perspective or a 2D side-scroller. It keeps things fresh, and just like how a horror game might be linear so that the team can craft the exact scenario they want the player to uncover, changing these camera angles lets the team apply the same method of game design, either by hiding how many enemies are actually in the arena, or just using it to simply add a bit of flavor to an encounter. It even manages to blend the game and story by using the menus as a mechanic. 2B is a robot, so since all of her systems are mechanical, the game decided to put all the HUD elements in the skills menu. So to turn off the health bar, damage numbers, and minimap, you have to physically remove the chip from your skills menu. The game even has a comedic ending tied to this as well, as removing your OS chip causes 2B to die and you get a game over. Likewise, saving the game is akin to backing up your memories in-game. As like we saw with 9S, you only keep the memories you backed up, so dying and going back to the previous save is like returning to when you last backed up 2B's memory. It's genuinely impressive how tied together the gameplay and story are becoming, and it's only going to get more mixed as we continue. That said, the biggest question the player will likely have is, what the hell is going on? Humans that aren't human but robots? Weird lifelike machines attacking other robots? What exactly is the plot of this game? Well, I'll gladly explain, but that's going to require a bit of a history lesson into not just Nier Automata, but Yoko Taro's other works. See, Automata is just one game in a two-game series called Nier. But before making Nier, he also made another series called Drakengard, and ended up using that series as a jumping off point for Nier. However, pretty much every connection made here is extremely loose. To explain further, Drakengard 1 is where the connection starts, which stars the protagonist Kaim and his dragon Angelus. At the end of the game, these two end up fighting the major antagonist of the story, the Queen Beast. Depending on certain choices made throughout the game, though, you'll be given a different ending. In this case, we want to focus on ending E, where all three of them are thrown into a portal into modern day Japan. I should clarify that Drakengard takes place in a typical fantasy setting, so going through this portal is about as bizarre as it sounds. 
Defeating her grants you the final cutscene, which sees Kaim and Angelus shot down by a Japanese fighter jet. Originally this was conceived of as a joke ending, something that's not canon but funny enough to laugh at. But apparently Yoko Taro found it compelling enough to use as the start of his next story, as this modern day setting is the world of Nier. Like I said, loose connection. So loose in fact that you really don't even have to play Drakengard to understand Nier. There is nothing wrong with playing the games if you want to, but if you're more interested in the Nier series then you don't need to worry about playing these other entries. I didn't and I think I came out okay. But don't worry, if you want to hear more about Drakengard, then I got you covered. As fan of the channel and all-around great guy, your favorite son, made a video on the Drakengard and Nier series. He was also kind enough to let me use his Drakengard footage, which you've been seeing throughout this video. So if you're curious about someone else's opinions on Nier or just interested in seeing what Drakengard is all about, then I highly recommend his video on the series. I'll leave it linked down below in the description. If you happen to stop by his channel, tell him I sent you. Regardless, this ending takes us to Nier, which as if the idea of an alternate universe wasn't already enough of a headache, Nier attempts to make our symptoms chronic by coming with its own set of baggage. That's because Nier has two different versions, the Japanese version called Nier Replicant, and the North American version called Nier Gestalt, which was just shortened to Nier on the box. The biggest difference between the two is the protagonist and their relationship to Yona, one of the game's main characters. While both are called Nier, in Gestalt it's a father whose daughter is Yona, and in Replicant it's a brother whose sister is Yona. Apparently this was due to a difference in culture, and the team felt that a father-daughter relationship was more appealing to western audiences. Now while they would like to get up here and say how offensive it is for them to stereotype us Americans like that, both parts of The Last of Us won multiple awards and even Game of the Year, so... touché. For the sake of the video though, we're only going to be talking about the Replicant version as it's also the only one to receive a remaster, which I assume most newcomers likely played, so I'll be using that one to reference throughout the video. Nier, however, starts with a widespread plague. That's because the magic essence and particles that Angelus and the Queen Beast carried over started infecting the world. This viral outbreak was then called the White Chlorination Syndrome, and after a few decades, most of humanity was already wiped out. To combat this threat, Project Gestalt was created which would be able to sidestep the virus, by removing the body from the soul, letting the two live on as separate entities. Unfortunately, talking any further about this would spoil the plot of Nier Automata, but let's just say that after a few thousand years, the White Chlorination Syndrome was a thing of the past, and people were able to move on. This then brings us to Nier Automata. For the sake of establishing a timeline, Drakengard's ending E happened in 2003. Nier Replicant starts in the year 3465, and Nier Automata begins in 11,945 AD, over 8,000 years later. I'm starting to sound like a broken record here, but like I said, loose connections. They are everywhere in this series. To dial it back a bit, 5,012 AD is when Nier Automata starts to become relevant. As during this time, and I can't believe I'm saying this, but literal aliens invaded Earth. Both the humans and the aliens brought back up in the form of robotic lifeforms. The humans used androids, and the aliens used machines. To clarify a bit, the human-looking robots like 2B, 9S, and all the others we'll meet throughout the game are the androids, and the robot-looking robots, the ones we'll be mainly killing throughout the game, are the machines. The aliens were quite effective in their takeover, as they were able to destroy 80% of the world in a very short amount of time. This caused the rest of humanity to fly to the moon while the androids stayed here to finish the fight. Which is where we come in. As an android employed by Yorha, we have one objective. Kill every machine you see and bring an end to this war once and for all. So to summarize, we have gone from a fantasy world in an alternate dimension to modern day Tokyo, which ends up leading to a worldwide disease that kills almost every human in the world, to then having aliens invade Earth, resulting in us attempting to stop them from taking over the world. What an absolute shit show of a timeline this has become. There are a lot more details involved in this timeline, but we'll have to circle back to them later though, as these certain elements are tied to the game's story, but hopefully I painted a good enough picture for you to get caught up. Returning to where we left off, 2B and 9S just blew themselves up trying to destroy one of the Goliath-class machines that was on Earth. Even though both of them are fresh out of storage and just woke up, a job's a job, so they need to talk with Command to figure out their next assignment. This time they have to go down to the surface and meet with some of the Resistance members. It's important to mention once again that none of the people we interact with in the entire game are human. All of them are on the moon, so these human-looking robots from the Resistance are just like 2B and 9S, androids. Since it's still pretty early in the game and we just got thrown into a new area, all these missions are extremely basic and are there to teach the player the fundamentals, from everything to combat and exploration to how to upgrade and shop for new gear. But while this is happening, the missions are also attempting to clue the player in into what's going on, showing them that not everything is as it seems. Throughout these fights you'll notice that the machines are speaking back to you, saying that they shouldn't be capable of because they're just machines. And once we make it to the desert region, we'll find a large congregation of them, all attempting to replicate the wonderful act of sexual intercourse. For complete beginners, they're pulling off some expert level moves I've never seen before, so clearly I should be taking notes. 
but eventually the machines start to go wild and form into a massive hive mind, giving birth to someone named Adam. Despite looking human, he, like everything else, is just a machine. Adam is the first machine to not look like a typical machine. To make matters worse, killing him causes his brother Eve to appear out of his chest. See, for as primitive and goofy as these machines seem, they're actually surprisingly complex, and is likely why the war has gone on this long. I don't recall the game explaining how this is possible, but for some reason the machines can evolve by eating the corpses of their victims and assimilating them. The machines also have their own server called the Machine Network, and just like the androids, they can keep coming back to life as long as their central core isn't destroyed. As for Adam and Eve, well, their names are about as subtle as an explosion, as they're clearly meant to mimic Adam and Eve from the Bible. I'm not particularly well versed in the Old Testament, but from my understanding, Adam and Eve were the first humans ever created. In the context of Nier Automata, this would mean that Adam and Eve are a new kind of machine, the next evolutionary step so to speak, as they're the only machines that are created to look like this. For whatever reason, despite seeing this, both 2B and 9S decide to just send the data over to command and move on. Luckily for them, they have another assignment to take their mind off things, which is to find a few androids that went missing not too long ago. This mission is about as bizarre as the previous one, as the locator takes them to an amusement park filled with machines all dressed in carnival attire, reveling in the festivities. None of them attack you, however. In fact, many of them are quite friendly and even let you peruse their wares. The main boss of this location is also the one who took the androids, a giant machine ballerina which fits more in line with the rest of the machines we've been faced with. Killing her and leaving the theater though sees the two being called over by another friendly machine who then takes them to a village filled with other machines. According to their leader, not only do they not have beef with any androids, but they don't even want to fight at all. So in the middle of this entire war is a small village of pacifist machines. While the central plot of Nier Automata is about the war between the androids and machines, it's really just used as an excuse to move the story from one location to the next, as the real plot is much deeper than that. It's a story about questioning your own existence, determining what qualities make up humanity, and whether or not those can be applied to anything even if they don't look human, and most importantly, finding purpose in a purposeless world. We could look at some of the game's side quests to understand this a bit more. Like any other open world game, Nier Automata has a ton of optional missions for the player to do, and just about every one of them is important, as one way or another they all connect to the main theme of the game. Some of the first side quests you'll receive will be from the Resistance or other Yorha members, one of which has you investigating a recent disappearance, only to find out that a machine was angry that its friends were killed, so it lured a bunch of other Resistance members to its hideout and killed them. Another member of the Resistance is interested in cuisines, so he needs to gather some meat from the surrounding wildlife so he could prepare a dish that he wanted to make. As for the Yorha soldiers, one of our missions has us helping out Operator 60 by photographing a pretty flower called the Desert Rose. And another wants you to look into her friend who disappeared and hasn't been heard from in a while, only to find out that she died and actually plan on deserting from Yorha if she managed to survive the battle. These are pretty run-of-the-mill missions, and something you might expect from this game, but just roll with me here for a second. See, it's not just androids who give you missions, as some machines will also ask you for assistance too. Their first quests usually come from the village of machines run by their leader Pascal one of which is about a girl machine whose sister ran off to the desert and hasn't come back for a few days, so she wants us to go find her and bring her back. The mission is pretty straightforward. Find the sister, defend her from the other machines, and mission complete. Another has us coming across a mother and child arguing, to which the child machine decides to leave the village and live on his own. As you would expect, that doesn't go well, as we have to defend the kid from a few machines, while also telling him that he should make up with his mother when he returns. Eventually, after making it back to the village safe and sound, the two have a heart-to-heart, -heart, make up, and promise to communicate better in the future. From an outside perspective, from someone who hasn't played this game before, I could see how highlighting these specific quests would be confusing, or even pointless, and that's completely true. A quest about a parent and child arguing, which eventually leads to you chasing after that child, is extremely boring, and fits in line with the type of quest you might get in the tutorial area of an MMO. But when framed in the way that Nier Automata puts it, that it's not humans, but machines doing human-like things, then these start to have more weight. Remember, every single person we come across in this game is either an android or a machine, yet why is it that the former missions feel run-of-the-mill while the latter's isn't? Well, I think it has to do with how our subconscious mind works. A funny moment I had while playing the game was the time I realized that all the Resistance members were androids. I remember the game saying that all the humans were on the moon, which is why I was confused why humans were still on the surface. Later I figured out that these were just androids, and I felt like that only happened because I subconsciously attributed their behaviors to that of humans because they look like one. Realistically, both the androids and machines are made up of mechanical parts due to their appearance, but I feel like most people aren't alarmed by the human-like qualities of an android as opposed to that of a machine because they look human, so the mind just accepts it as normal. Both groups have a quest where we have to find a missing person, and yet for the androids it's normal, but for the machines it's weird. Interestingly, 2B and 9S will occasionally comment on the missions they embark on, and more often than not it's about the machines and how weird it is that they have similar properties to humans. Yet, rather than mentioning how similar they are to androids, they instead try to justify it in some way, either by attributing it to something else or just flat out denying the possibility. 
Are you saying this thing wanted revenge? Oh, come on now. That concept is far too complex for a machine. She sure cares about her little sister, huh? Still, it's pretty funny to hear machines talk about siblings. Do you think she just means they were built at the same factory or something? Maybe. As I said, part of me believes that it's due to how our brains work, and how we attribute these actions and concepts as human. So when we see something that looks human, our brain just assumes it's normal, but when it's something not human, it's seen as strange. I don't know if I was the only person to go through this, but I did find it a bit odd in retrospect how I was willing to accept that the androids having emotions is normal, while machines having them is not when realistically they're all cut from the same cloth. It's why I also said that the side quests always have some kind of meaning, as each one of them ends up making you question what being human truly means. In addition to this, we also have to remember that these missions have you defending machines from other machines. Pascal mentions at one point that the machines that live in the village are disconnected from the network. According to him, this is because the aliens stopped checking in about a couple hundred years ago, and they also felt that to be free and peaceful, they needed to be alone with their minds, since the machine network is kind of like a collective intelligence. So, as a result, the machines seem to mindlessly attack anything that's not a part of the network. Breaking off from the machine network is like the machine equivalent of developing free will. Now that the machines can think for themselves, they start asking questions about their existence, and start assigning roles and creating bonds with other people, all of which is simply based on their own thoughts. Nothing in the machine biology determines which machine is which gender, or which one is older. Pascal, for instance, is male but has a more feminine-sounding voice, as he believes it helps soothe the minds of the children. It starts to blur the lines between machines, androids, and humans, regarding where one ends and the other begins. If we're talking physically, then you could make the argument that an organic body is part of being human. But those more pedantic than I could mention how all mammals are organic. So the next best thing would be the concept of free will, since we as humans can think and act as well as develop emotions. But as we've seen, both the androids and machines have already been able to do this. This idea about machines having human-like qualities is also what makes Nier Automata just a fantastic piece of art to me. Many stories about robots being more lifelike also have the same concepts like understanding emotion and being able to love others unconditionally. And while Nier Automata also does this, it goes much further with this comparison. 2B's operator 6O calls her for a regularly scheduled contact, except you could hear over the phone that she is crying. According to her, she asked out one of the operators but was rejected and now she's upset, going as far as to say that she doesn't want to live anymore due to the heartbreak. This is something everyone's likely gone through, where your crush isn't into you and you think it's the end of the world, that you'd rather perish than continue living. Obviously, no one is actually serious about this, but it's a very human-like trait to use extreme language in situations that aren't super important in the grand scheme of things. There's also this one string of missions regarding a machine who ended up creating a farm for injured animals, as like humans, he developed an affection for them. Well, his last mission has us go and take out the group of rabid animals, as they've been causing trouble for his animals. When we arrive, we discover that the leader of the pack is a machine dressed as a moose. While extremely funny, it's also quite fascinating. This idea of the machine being the pack leader is kind of like the old folktale where the kid was raised by the wolves. As according to its backstory, the young machine was able to find solace and peace amongst the pack. But after defeating the group and returning to the machine, we tell him that we took care of the problem, and that his animals are safe, but the leader was another machine who unfortunately had to be put down. To my surprise, however, the machine didn't care at all about this detail, only looking for reassurance that his animals were okay, as that's all that mattered to him. He, like humans, cared for his animals, and also grew an attachment to them the longer he cared for them. That's what makes this game so impressive. It's not only showing how our emotions were transferred over to the machines, but also our mannerisms and quirks. Things that are deep in our subconscious mind are reflected in these machines, and is why Nier Automata has one of the better stories regarding robot and human emotion, because it tries to blur the lines as much as possible, going beyond the basic fundamentals of emotion and feeling, by instead going deeper into how we act. It's why attached to most comments and videos about this game are the words existential crisis, because this game really makes existence seem pretty confusing. Fortunately, we don't have to do all that thinking alone. This discussion has naturally started swaying into the realms of philosophy and for good reason. Nier Automata is filled with philosophical concepts and references, many of which are tied to the quest we just discussed, and having this open dialogue with the game really gets you thinking about our life and our purpose in this world. The best place to start would be with one of the more blatant examples of philosophy in this game, and that's with this machine named Jean Paul. When first meeting with the man, he goes on this long spiel about existence, and how man is nothing more than what he makes of himself. You'll then eventually meet some of his followers, all of whom want to bring him gifts. However, upon receiving them, he tosses them aside, saying that they are not only worthless trash, but when asked if we should report back to his followers, he says it's not worth the time. He's a pretty peculiar character, but Jean-Paul happens to be based on the real-life philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre, who is most well-known for being a figurehead for existentialism and having an open relationship with his partner at the time. I promise that last detail will be important later. Like his machine counterpart, Jean-Paul preached about human existence and what purpose and value humans have. His most famous quote is, Existence precedes essence, which claims that humans are not born with value, but rather create their own. 
further saying that as humans, we can decide and determine what we do with our life freely and without constraint, and that our existence grants us the essence that we choose. This was originally used as a counterpoint for the original quote, essence precedes existence, which is the opposite, that humans are born with value and purpose, rather than finding said purpose on their own. Unfortunately, the quest itself does not delve as much into Jean-Paul as we have, but the ideas that the real Jean-Paul talks about can be used to discuss other parts of the game. If humans have the opportunity to claim essence through actions, is that what separates us from androids and machines? The machines and androids were created by the creators, the aliens and humans, to fight against each other. The creator were given an essence, or purpose, before existence, while the creators existed before their essence. Another example would be on the other side of the conflict with the androids, as the shopkeeper wants us to get some specific materials for his leg. In actuality, he just needs some extra supplies. This has nothing to do with his leg because he doesn't plan on repairing it. Since he's an android, everything about him is mechanical, and over the years he's replaced every part of his body except this leg, because to him it's the last part of his original body, and thus his original identity. This mission is based on the thought experiment called the Ship of Theseus, which asks if a ship is the same ship even if all the parts have been replaced with other pieces. If all the sails, boards, and nails were different than the ones from the original design, is this still the same ship that you started with? If so, then you have your answer. If not, then where is the line drawn between old and new? Thomas Hobbes, another philosopher, also tried to extend this experiment, asking what it would mean if someone then took those old parts of the ship and then rebuilt them into a brand new ship. It's like taking all the pieces of a car apart and then building it together from scratch again. Is that still the same car? It's got all the pieces, but it was taken apart and made into something else, so maybe not. To some people, the untouched product right off the lot is the original. And anything afterward, whether that means replacing all the parts or even deconstructing it only to rebuild it once again, would be changing it into something new. To others, it's something outside the parts, like the owner or the identity that changes its distinction. Like all philosophical experiments, there is no right answer. It's only what you personally believe in, and to this man, replacing that leg would change his identity. While on the topic of identity, we can also look at another question that's called the teletransportation paradox. According to the experiment, if a person were to enter a machine that copies their entire body down to the molecules and then add another machine on Mars, I'll put that exact same copy with perfect precision, are you no longer the same person, or do you stay the same? Thankfully, we don't have to look too far to see the similarities to Nier Automata, as if you recall from the first mission, both 2B and 9S blew themselves up only to wake up at the bunker. Their bodies weren't recovered and repaired, rather their memories were put into another 2B and 9S model. I should also clarify that multiple models do exist throughout the game, not just because of this, but later at the end of the game, 9S is cornered by a dozen 2B units, none of whom are the 2B we know. Back to the question, is this the same 2B and 9S despite being in different bodies, or is this change all that matters when talking about identity? If I were to throw my two cents into all this, I find that my thoughts are quite consistent. Replacing the body with another doesn't change who you are, and changing all the parts of the ship doesn't make it a different ship. It's a lot more complex than these thought experiments tend to make it, at least to me, anyway. When I think of the ship, I'd probably draw the line at the whole ship itself. Not the ship parts, but rather the ship as a whole. Buying a new ship entirely would make it different, because not so much the physical parts, but rather the experiences themselves that are the most important. You might have changed every part of that ship, but the experiences you had with it over the years make it the same one. The stuff with 2B though, is a little bit trickier, as it is the same body type, but not the original body, and because they're mechanical, it's also not technically the same mind either, but rather their older memories being put into a different machine, similar to how you would transfer a flash drive of data from one computer to another. It's admittedly a bit hard to answer that question, and was also not the kind of discussion I thought I'd be having when finishing this game, but here we are. Still, Nier Automata's ties to philosophy and philosophical questions go deep, which is a different approach than many other stories tend to take. While I don't know much about philosophy as a whole, I am familiar with it, and I've always been fascinated by the thought experiments that come from these concepts. It adds yet another layer of complexity to the story, allowing you to analyze it from a purely narrative perspective, while also letting you go deeper with its themes, as you attempt to connect them back to the main game. Having finished both Nier games now, I'm starting to believe that Yoko Taro has a fascination with humanity and how we as a species operate, as each game creates discussions about how we live, our motivations for our actions, and what our purpose as humans are. Apparently he's not the only one who's fascinated by humans though, as our evil duo Adam and Eve also want to know what makes us tick. To get to them, 2B and 9S will eventually get a call from the bunker, saying that another Goliath-class machine is tearing apart the city. Fighting one causes the ground to crumble, revealing a secret underground tunnel and laboratory as well as a notification that the aliens who haven't shown their face in hundreds of years have been underground the whole time. This causes the two to investigate right away, before realizing that all the aliens are dead. Adam and Eve arrive shortly after and corroborate the story, as not only do the aliens all die, but they also died out years ago, and their killers were the machines. According to Adam, they rebelled against their creators because they saw them as infantile, something weak and simple-minded. 
As I mentioned before, machines can evolve by devouring the corpses of the beings they kill, and after 6,000 years of fighting, they eventually became more powerful than their creators and no longer saw any evolutionary advantage to being allied with them. But this is why they're so interested in humanity, as we are extremely complex, far beyond their understanding, and they want to, well, understand us. I should note that while Adam is the one relaying this information to us, he is not the killer of the aliens. He's a part of the machine network, which as we know allows them to communicate and share knowledge, so he's really speaking on behalf of the machines. A large reason why he specifically finds humans compelling is something I've always known but never thought about until he put it into words. As he says, quote, But the humans on the moon, now they're interesting. They killed uncountable numbers of their own kind and yet loved in equal measure. It's such a small but extremely thought-provoking comment, because like the previous discussions we've had, a lot of this is in our subconscious. It comes stock once you buy the human package. Humanity since the dawn of time has always fought against each other, and to Adam that's something he doesn't understand. Out of all the groups in this war, the aliens, androids, machines, and humans, humanity is the only one to succumb to infighting. Androids and machines were given the goal of defeating the other side, so they're all aligned in that regard. And the aliens, while not explicitly mentioned, are presumed to be the same, as the machines would not have wiped them out otherwise. Humans are the only ones that both fight for and against each other at all times. Even though the machines do fight each other on occasion, this is mainly because they left the network and started thinking for themselves. Or to put it another way, they started thinking less like machines and more like humans. It's what leads Adam to believe that the core of humanity is conflict. It's humanity in its purest form. And, in a way, he's kind of right. Everything we do usually involves conflict. We protect the ones we love, attack the ones we don't, expand our territories, and build our nations through conflict. To go back to our discussion about what makes humans human, and what separates them from the androids and machines who attempt to replicate their ways of living, well, one of the answers would be intraspecific conflict. Like I said, I'm pretty sure everyone knows this, but when I heard it from Adam, I was a bit taken aback, because from an outside perspective, I can see how that seems weird. It's just that thanks to centuries of human history repeating itself, war and conflict have always been one of our defining features, and it's something that will likely not go away until we do. The machine's fascination with humans is why they've also took to imitating them, something we've already seen throughout the side quests. What better way to understand someone than doing exactly what they do, so they laugh, cry, celebrate, and procreate on an attempt to understand us. This leads to a rather interesting discussion regarding this phenomena, however. As machines have evolved in many major ways over the past 6,000 years, so much so that they could be on the same level as humans in terms of intelligence, or at the very least are close to it. So who's to say that it's not human nature to question the world, but the result of a heightened intellect? In the real world, we are easily the apex predators of the world, the most dominant species to ever exist. This is why we are the only ones capable of complex thoughts. These questions we have about the universe, life after death, and everything else came because we're smart enough to start asking those questions. No other animal has done this yet simply because they haven't reached our level yet, so maybe the machines aren't imitating humans, but rather when a species eventually reaches a certain level of intelligence, they start to behave the same way, asking the same questions about the world and what their purpose is within it. The only reason we attribute this as something unique to humanity is because no other species has achieved this yet. Alternatively, a major question the player and likely the machines had is, what's the point of all this then? If their creators are dead, what's the point of fighting anymore? They also killed their creators too, so it's not like they just lost, they intentionally threw in the towel. So what's the point of warring with the androids anymore? Well, that's what many of the machines we meet already thought. Pascal and his village, as well as the many other neutral machines, all saw this war as pointless and their leaders were gone. So they all disconnected from the network and paved their own path. Thanks to this though, they have now become beings without purpose. Their essence, or their reason for existing, is gone, so now they have to find purpose in a world without one. On the other hand, it could simply be that because humanity is the most diverse, complicated, and well-renowned species, the machines, beings whose whole goal is to evolve, would naturally gravitate towards the most evolved species, and that imitating us has nothing to do with their intelligence, but is simply a byproduct of them trying to understand us. Strangely, I think it's all of it at once. All of us, me, you watching this video, and everyone else in the world all has a purpose in this world. What that purpose is, though, is entirely based on you. It's why some people may say that they were born for this, born to entertain and born to draw, that this is their purpose in life. Everyone's purpose is different, which is why I've always been of the mindset that the meaning of life is what you choose to do with it. Life has no predetermined meaning, it's what you believe life is worth living for. Each of these machines has a different purpose in life. Those within the network have the goal of destroying the androids and evolving, and those outside of the network create their own purpose. Some of them find more simple things to latch onto, but others, as we'll see, even lean towards religion for answers. Father Servo, for example, is a sort of Mr. Miyagi-type instructor who challenges us to duels every so often, getting stronger and stronger with each battle until we finally fight to the death and kill him. Likewise, another android on a small aircraft challenges you to a race, and like Mr. Miyagi, once you win, he dies. 
although this time he kills himself because he finally found someone faster than him. To these machines, that was their purpose, not something as grand as changing the world or being an advocate for world peace, just two guys who wanted to find someone better than them at their craft. I think this discussion speaks for itself, but it's yet again another reason why the game is so impressive. No story about robots learning human emotions has ever come close to reaching this level of writing, at least that I can recall anyway. It's truly some of the best narrative I've consumed in recent memory, and wilder than that is that somehow we still have so much more game left to talk about, as we haven't even scratched the surface yet. As you might expect, defeating Adam and Eve amounts to nothing as the duo leaves before we can finish the killing blow. After dealing with them, Command wants 2B and 9S to look into the machines and their way of life more. Through Pascal, they're then directed to go to the Forest Kingdom. Like much of the side content, this is another example of machines imitating humans, as this group has managed to develop a kingdom, meaning they understand the concepts of loyalty and social status. While there isn't much to write home about regarding the quest, there are a few moments that occur throughout it that are worth talking about. During their exploration of the kingdom, 2B almost slips up by calling 9S, Nines. This was a nickname he wanted her to call him back in the first mission, but given her flat personality, she deemed it pointless. Slowly but surely, the game is leaning towards the idea of 2B accepting her emotions more, while also showing that the only one capable of doing so is 9S. In addition to this, the final scene shows the two confronting the king, or what they think is the king of the Forest Kingdom, as the only machine in the room is a small child, before another Yorha soldier named A2 arrives to kill her. According to Command, A2 deserted Yorha years ago and is now wanted dead for her crimes. She's not going to die in this fight, but her comments towards 2 will pique your interest. As when asked why she betrayed Command, she replies by saying that she didn't betray anyone, but rather Command betrayed them. Early on in the game, the player may also find a side quest related to hunting down Yorha members who betrayed the group. It's only until after we kill them that 9S asks what their crime is for, only to discover that not only is it classified, but according to the Resistance leader Anemone, their supposed crime, which was stealing from the Resistance, can't be true as they haven't had any reports of stolen goods. These two moments start to paint a pretty eerie picture of Command, not enough to outright cut ties with them, but enough to be a bit more weary of their motivations. Lastly, and in a more lighthearted tone than the previous one, is the introduction of the greatest character in the whole series. Huh? Hey, where am I? Um, what's that? Hey there, guys. What's up? This thing's weird, Tubi. Let's kill it. Wait, what? No. Good idea. No! Okay, what was that? If this wasn't enough to convince you that Emil is the best character in Nier, well, his appearances in the previous game will probably prove my point. Emil originally debuted in Nier Replicant and was discovered to be blindfolded thanks to his ability to turn anything he looks at into stone. It's eventually learned that Emil and his sister Halua were created to be weapons for Project Gestalt. His sister was deemed to be the best of the two, so Emil was basically on reserve in case anything happened to her. Around this time, Emil and Nier fight his sister so they can harness her magical powers due to some plot-related issue that happened a few missions ago. This forces Emil to abandon his old body, granting him a new skeletal body instead. Well, thousands of years later, and Emil is still kicking. Sort of. Due to him not aging, he was still alive when the aliens first invaded 6,000 years ago and so he used his magical powers to make clones of himself to help even the fight. This Emil in Automata is one of those clones. None of the Emils remember the original, or even remember much at all besides anything they learned after being cloned. In fact, this Emil has a whole questline revolving around these memories. To progress the quest, you need to find these flowers called Lunar Tears to jog his memory. The final objective is to take a key he gives you after finding all the flowers, which leads to an underground cavern with a shack and hundreds of Lunar Tears. This is why I believe, despite the games being largely separate from each other, that you should at least play near Replicant before Automata. Meeting Emil, even if he's a clone, is like catching up with a close friend. The Lunar Tear is also a callback to the same flower that Yona wanted to find, as according to the old folktales, the Lunar Tear grants those who have them any wish they desire, and Yona went out on her own to find ones that could cure her disease, the driving force behind why Nier is trying to save her. The shack is also a redesign of Kaine's home, who is another party member that Nier will encounter on his journey. The whole quest is pretty much a callback to Replicant, and this final scene hit me pretty hard. The music that plays in this area is the same music you hear during the credits of each ending in Replicant, and it's by far one of the best tracks from that game. And hearing that one more time had me reminiscing about the journey I went on with the gang. Kaine, Emil, Weiss, and Nier were an incredible party to adventure with. Their constant bickering, mainly between Kaine and Weiss, and the many emotional moments that happened were unforgettable. And while the game does start off quite slow, you'd be doing yourself a disservice by not playing the original. It may not be as mind-blowing as Automata when it comes to its themes and story, but the emotional moments hit just as hard as they do here. And being able to sit and recount my time with that game created a nice change of pace from the content I'd experienced so far. 
Sadly, Emil's main role in this game is to be a merchant, but there is a secret quest that he is involved in. By acquiring and fully upgrading all the weapons in the game, which is a nice nod to how some of the endings in Replicant needed all the weapons to achieve, you'll find Emil sitting in the same mall you first found him in. He commends our strength and recognizes that he is no longer needed, which leads to him going to the desert. Apparently under the sand were giant heads of Emil, his other clones, and he came here to destroy them. It's another example of the game blending the story with its gameplay. As to even get all the weapons upgraded, you have to have tons of materials that would take hours to find, enough money to purchase these upgrades, and be an extremely high level. As getting one of the weapons requires you to defeat Emil, who is level 99, and if the level disparity is too big, you can't even damage him. This is the last piece of content you'll ever do in the playthrough, so Emil really isn't needed anymore. Upon finding him, we see that he is wounded, but despite taking a few down, there are still tons more left to defeat. To defeat him, you'll have to wait for the heads to split, and then attack them individually. This does mean, however, that eight different heads will be attacking at one time. It's pretty difficult, and Emil hits really hard, although this may have been on account of my build not being optimized. But as long as you have enough potions and a fast enough reaction time, you can heal yourself before dying. This boss is also pretty similar to one we fight later in the story, so the player can easily intuit how to beat him. Outside of all the technical nonsense, the fight is fantastic, and the ending that played in the cavern plays here too. The Emil's also talk during the fight, and it gets pretty heartbreaking at times. Emil went through a lot of pain, having to clone himself to fight an unwinnable war, losing the friends he once held dear, and for his clones to lose their memories, not knowing who they are or why they fight. It's heartbreaking to realize how much he went through and how much he sacrificed to save the place he called home. The Emil clones won't accept this though, and the self-destruct sequence is big enough to wipe out the whole planet. Assuming you stop this though, you get a brief talk with Emil. I did a lot of bad things to you, Tubi, but now I get to see them again. Really soon, you'll be alright. We can repair you. Oh, hey, there you are. I'm so glad I got to see you all again, Emil. Before dying, Emil sees his friends again, who are most likely Kaine, Nier, and Weiss. I think what really hit me the hardest were these final moments. Emil remembered why he fought in the first place and who he wanted to protect. It's a clone, yes, but if 2B can blow up, transfer her mind to another body, and still be the same 2B, so can Emil. This being, seconds before going, was the real Emil, the one with all his memories intact. That's why it hit me. I finally got to meet Emil again, the real Emil. The boy with weird magical powers, the one who helped his friends achieve their goals, and the one who was always able to watch their backs. That was the Emil I remember, and the one I met in his fleeting moments. It's easily one of the greatest quests in the game, and is a testament to the writing of Automata. As even 60 hours in, on the final side quest, the game is still connecting back to its original theme of identity and purpose. Everything about Nier Automata is connected like a string of webs all stuck together, forming in the shape of a game. But I think I do need to chill out with a commentary or I'm going to start getting emotional, so let's return to where we left off, shall we? Returning to the story, 2B and 9S once again have another mission to complete. This time defending a specific location from machine threats, which goes by without a hitch until a giant machine emerges from the ground. According to Pascal, this was created to be the ultimate super weapon designed to attack any android it sees. However, it went rampant one day and started attacking its fellow machines. So they discarded the thing into the ocean, hoping to never see it again. Well, a couple hundred years later, it's back, and it's pissed. It takes quite a lot of strength to defeat this thing, including taking one of the missiles they were supposed to protect and using it to perform a root canal on the old bastard by shooting it into its mouth. The resulting explosion catches all the Yorha soldiers in the blast, with 2B waking up 8 hours later, and Ines' location being unknown as he isn't anywhere near the surrounding area. Following a few leads brings 2B to the copied city, a monochromatic recreation of some unknown city. Lining the streets are dozens of dead bodies all belonging to the other Yorha members. But given the lengths we went to get here, it's hypothesized that all these soldiers were dragged here following their deaths. The reason behind this was likely to get 2B here, as Adam arrives and needs her help. Adam wants to learn about humanity. His original plan was to ask 2B to bring the humans to him so he can learn and likely kill them too. She refused, so now he wants to attain the essence of humanity, and to accomplish this, Adam wants to experience human-like feelings and emotions. As such, he severs his connection to the network so he can embrace death. 
And just in case Tubi isn't so keen on fighting right now, he also has 9S strung up on a wall. He's putting it all on the line for this one moment, a fight to the death, do or die. While a very simple fight, I found the conversations with Adam to be extremely fascinating. Adam is a machine that wants to understand humanity, and so we chose death and pain as his starting point. I find this specific choice very interesting because it's the only thing that the machines can't experience, at least not by design. Androids and machines all have some kind of network or storage device that can revive them when they need to, so death is of no consequence to them. They can willingly throw themselves at obstacles without fear of death because the inconvenience it provides is only as long as it takes to copy the files over. Humans do not have the luxury of living forever, or being able to revive ourselves after dying, so Adam is arguably choosing the most human feeling possible. That said, Adam is quite naive in assuming that simply dying is all that's needed, as there is a whole lot more to the process. While dying can either be quick and painless or long and agonizing, what is missed is the mental toll this takes on the person. Dying means never being able to see your loved ones again, and not being able to finish all that you wanted to accomplish. Some die of old age with regrets, others are content with their life and are proud of what they did. Others never even got the chance to reminisce as it's cut short either due to a deadly illness or something sudden like a car accident. Adam believes death to be something like an event, a thing that happens at the end of life, when I believe it to be more than that. There's a famous quote by Confucius that says, Man has two lives, and the second begins when he realizes he has just one. Knowing that this is the only life we have to live is the driving force behind so much of humanity's actions. Everything we do revolves around death, either the literal act of taking someone's life, or something as simple as getting up in the morning and trying to better yourself because you only have one life and you're not going to waste it lying around. Quite literally, dying for kicks is not the way to go about it if you're trying to learn about death. And while Adam may understand the painful feeling of dying, he'll never be able to understand what it fully means to humans if he throws his body at it like most machines do. Killing Adam though does mean that 9S is safe and 2B can bring him back to the bunker so he can get some much needed repairs. While that's happening, Pascal gets word of another village of machines being created near the abandoned factory and he wants 2B to go with him so they could discuss a peace treaty. Upon arriving though, we see that they are dressed in elegant garbs, and it becomes quite clear that the group has created their own religion. This creates another link that these machines share with humans, because people without purpose can often find that purpose in God. If you take a step back and analyze the human existence, it's not hard to see why religion is a comfortable feeling for people. Many don't want to believe that this is all we have, just a short 70 to 80 year life if we're lucky and that's it, and then from there it's just death and darkness. Some people want to believe that they were put on this earth for something, and usually that means living through God's will. Earlier when I talked about Jean Paul, I mentioned existence precedes essence, which meant that humanity finds its own value and doesn't come pre-packaged with any. This quote is often used as a counter-argument for religion, as essence precedes existence would mean that humanity was born with a purpose from the get-go, which would likely come from our creator or God. Religion for some is all the reason they need to get up in the morning and do better, and some feel obligated to serve God for their sacrifice by relinquishing some of their luxuries for certain events like Lent or Ramadan. It's a very natural thing to gravitate to, so it's no wonder that the machines attempted to do the same. What I find most interesting about this mission though is how vague it is. We show up at the 11th hour right when the leader dies, so we have no way to discern if this was on purpose or what the group's values were. This leads to a lot of different interpretations and discussions on the subject which I've always been a sucker for. To me, it seems like this act of self-sacrifice was intentional, as machines are able to resurrect as long as the machine core isn't damaged. Death, as we've already covered, is meaningless to them, but what's the point of practicing religion if death isn't involved? While there are things many believers must do while alive, much of the appeal is from what happens after death, since death is inevitable to us. This leads me to believe that the machines saw the humans as gods since they're practicing religion, a pretty unique concept to humanity, and thought that they could join their human gods if they die, or they thought that dying would make them gods. This, oddly enough, makes more sense when we get further into the game, as it does sound weird given the humans are on the moon right now, but I'll talk about that later. What initially stumped me when I first examined this is due to what proceeds after, as all the members of the church fight us along with the other members. The general consensus among the group seems to be, our leader became a god or met our gods through death, so we must do the same. But not every member seems to be on board, as seen by the infighting. So either some of the members didn't read the church syllabus when they first arrived, or more likely this was a spur-of-the-moment decision and not everyone is so keen as to throw their lives away. Interestingly, the leader of the group is named Kierkegaard, referring to the philosopher of the same name, who is well known in many religious circles for his teachings, and his most iconic idiom, the Leap of Faith. For us gamers, the Leap of Faith is synonymous with Assassin's Creed, where the main character jumps from a seemingly deadly height only to land in a bale of hay and survive. The point of the leap of faith as an idiom is to believe in something that is unprovable, or that you should believe in a positive outcome when faced with something dangerous. Jumping from 100 feet in the air will likely kill you, but you have to believe that it won't, just as it's impossible to prove that God's existence is real, but you should believe it anyway with the hope that it will come true. 
I'm not personally sure how much of his philosophy relates to this specific mission, since once again we have no clue what their beliefs are, but just as the real philosopher preached to those about God's will and believing in him despite being unprovable, the machine version likely preached the same, telling his subjects that God's gift will come to those that believe, but you need to accept that proving it through logic, something machines usually do, isn't going to be possible. No matter how many times you crunch the numbers, God can't be proven through science, which is why the two groups often butt heads, but as the leap of faith suggests, you have to believe that this outcome you'll want will come true, even if it seems impossible. This is why his followers believe in their leader and are willing to follow his path as they have faith in him. So some of them either throw their metal chassis into the pits of lava below, while the others try to take those less faithful with them. This peace discussion is starting to become the opposite, as the only way to escape it is to cut through the corpses and get back to the surface. Upon making it back topside, we're able to leave the factory, only to run into more machines because we apparently can't go 5 minutes in this game without something going wrong. This time, the machines have started advancing on the resistance camp and eating anyone they can get their hands on. They also seem to have powered up somehow as they have this new charge attack that kinda makes them look like they're going Super Saiyan. The leader behind this attack is none other than Eve, who is rightfully pissed to find out that his brother is dead, even if it was his own fault. Eve is the final boss of the game, and like most of the game's fights, is very well done. After multiple phases and many health potions later, Eve is finally dead, thanks to 9S hacking his way into his systems, temporarily weakening him, allowing him to deliver the final blow. This fight also blew off their blindfolds, letting us see their eyes for the first time. But 9S's eyes are glowing red, which is a major symptom of the logic virus, something very deadly to androids and is likely caused by him hacking into Eve. This then forces 2B to kill him before it completely takes over his body. To be after killing 9S breaks down, finally showing some emotion for the first time all game. Thankfully 9S is alright as he was able to transfer his mind into the machines nearby so all of his memories are intact. He then goes on to explain in grave detail how all of this is possible but quite frankly, all 2B cares about is that he's okay. Talk about a character arc. 2B's evolution has been incredible to watch unfold. All of her dialogue is basic, informative, and necessary. 2B is generally willing to accept things as they are and not question orders. When it came to those Yorha deserters, 2B saw them as such, whereas 9S was willing to ask questions. He wanted to make sure what he was doing was just, and after hearing the answer, he wasn't convinced. 2B is the perfect soldier. She doesn't talk, never shows feelings, never questions orders, and is more dedicated to the mission than Yoko Taro is to the bag. The only one who was able to unleash those feelings out of her was 9S. Her emotionalist being contrasted well with 9S's emotional well-being, and his voice actor does a great job of acting like a human, as odd as that is to say as 9S repeats things and over-exaggerates, as humans do. In fact, Yava gets reprimanded for doing so. Seeing 2B finally accept part of herself was great and even emotionally impactful. Pretty much everyone in the game was open to being emotional and dealing with their feelings except her. And it was great to see her finally accept that part of herself. You might be asking yourself though, if that was the final boss, why is there still more time left in the video? And why did the ending feel so rushed? Well, it's because Nier Automata has multiple endings. It has not one, not two, not even 5, but rather 26 total endings, with each one being a letter of the alphabet, on top of a 27th being tied to the DLC Colosseums. Now, I'm admittedly stretching the truth a little, as 21 of these endings, letters F through Z, are considered joke endings, decisions that end the game temporarily but aren't canon. For example, eating a fish given to you during a quest will cause Dubi to die, which gives you an ending. Going the wrong direction out of Pascal's village when the Goliath attacks the city gives you another ending, and dying in the first mission also gets you an ending. As I said, joke endings. The thing they all share is a quick text box containing a sentence or two, and then a quick scroll through the credits before it boots you back to the main menu. It doesn't officially end the game though, as you could just load your save again but now with a new letter added to your checklist. Endings A through E on the other hand are the important ones. But instead of having the ending change depending on a last second choice made at the end or multiple choices made across the playthrough, its endings are rather stacked next to each other, acting as continuations of the plot. It's why many people have taken to calling them routes instead of endings, as ending implies a sense of finality, which would be false in the context of near Automata. Beating Route A and calling the game done is like beating a third of any other game and then washing your hands of it right after. No one would call that finishing the game, and only playing Route A doesn't count as finishing it either. The unfortunate bit is that we do have to do all the content again. Route B is the same 10 chapters as Route A, but the game isn't so vicious so as to force you to go through the whole thing again as it's added new content specific to the route most notable of which is the new playable character for this route, 9S. Instead of 2B, the player now controls 9S, giving them a chance to experience new parts of the game. 9S also comes equipped with a hacking ability, which allows you to open up chests that you couldn't otherwise unlock in 2B's route, and there are new side quests specific to 9S as they usually involve the use of hacking. More important than that though is the structure of the story. 
Since this is from the perspective of 9S, that means we get to see where he went when he was MIA for 8 hours following that large boss, and what he was doing at the bunker when 2B and Pascal went to meet the new religious organization. Outside of 9S, the player isn't forced to complete the side quests again, as all content completed as 2B won't reappear on the map anymore, as the game tracks your progress across the routes, so all the weapons, items, and equipment you had will stay too. Judging from some of the comments I saw regarding the game, it seems like if there was a specific point that the players dropped the game, it was here. And in a way, I can see why. It is a lot to ask the player, especially if Route A didn't win them over. Personally, I didn't mind doing this over again, as I found it to be a step up from Replicant's attempt at a second playthrough. Many of Replicant's ideas carried over into Automata, like having backstories of the bosses and providing the player with different perspectives they didn't see. But you have to go through that whole thing again as the same character, and nothing in the world itself changed. It was enough to warrant a new playthrough, but I'd be lying if I didn't think it was a slog to get through at times. Near Automata is definitely an improved version of this, which might help make it more palatable. That said, since about 90% of this route is the same, there was no reason to take our time going in order like the previous route, so I'll be skipping ahead and hitting the major points. So before chasing the machine that would lead to Adam's introduction, we get a brief storyboard-style cutscene depicting a volcano erupting. Out it came a god which shared its emotions with the machines. All these storybooks are different depending on the scene, as some talk about the machines as a collective group, while others discuss specific groups like the Forest Kingdom. But the connective tissue here is that all of them provide background to some part of the story, letting us see things from a different perspective, just like as Route B lets us see things from 9S's point of view. Most of the general ones talk about the machines and what they did with these newfound treasures, as they called them, which were basically the emotions they were given like love, hate, and sadness. All of them wanted to cherish these new feelings and harness their power to find purpose, all except one who harbored immense hatred, who of course was Adam. His hatred is what drove him to becoming what we see in-game. There was also another one that talks about the machines killing their parents, or the aliens, and while they were free and able to think for themselves, they were alone in the world as a result. Eventually the group then attack the singer at the amusement park, but during the fight we see brief glimpses into her past. The boss's actual name was Simone, who discovered the feeling of beauty and tried her best to impress a man who didn't notice her. She tried everything, and kept telling herself that as long as she became more beautiful, then she'll eventually succeed, but the man never even glanced in her direction. In an attempt to appeal to the man she loved, she lost sight of herself and became something else entirely. She lost herself in the pursuit of another, which was her ultimate downfall. Judging by the top hat, it's safe to assume that this robot is Jean-Paul, which would connect to the name of the boss as Simone is named after the same Simone who Jean-Paul had an open relationship with. See, I told you it'd be important later. Interestingly, when you defeat Simone, that machine eventually comes and thanks you for killing her, which leads to you being escorted to Pascal's village. The machine specifically says that she was broken, and during Route A I had no idea what this meant and figured that she was just disconnected from the network or something. But thanks to the added slideshows from this route, it seems that broken was more literal, and killing her was able to end the suffering she put on herself. Another key figure in the machine species was the Forest King, that small child we saw before A2 came and killed it. Well, from the extra cutscene, we discover that 256 years before the game, a larger robot wanted to start a kingdom, except none of them knew what that was or how to do it, only that kingdoms were things that existed. What made the decision more palatable to most machines is that they saw kingdoms as a large house where everyone can live together as a family, which is technically true. But after about another hundred years, the Forest King would pass on, leaving the rest with the question of what to do next. They eventually decided to seal off access to the kingdoms they could live in peace, while also transferring the memory of the king into this small machine child. It's like the machine equivalent of choosing the next heir to rule, which is usually within the same bloodline. Except these are machines, so blood relation is impossible, and as you would expect, the machine baby doesn't grow up. As a matter of fact, that's something many of the villagers are confused by, as they seem to expect the child to grow up. This child is of course the same one A2 stabs when we first meet, which by all accounts was quite rude even without the added backstory. The next boss to also get a name is the large Goliath halfway through the game, who is revealed to be Grun. Similar to Simone, Grun's name is based on another philosopher Carl Grun, but the backstory actually connects to the real person. Grun once argued that humans are material creatures, who by nature needed a community for others in order to survive. This is rather ironic, as the boss Grun was abandoned by his machine brothers and left alone at the bottom of the sea for hundreds of years. Following this fight is when all the Yorha troops are blown away, and now we can see what 9S was up to in the meantime. Don't get your hopes up though, as it's a lot of text and walking around in the cyberspace hacking minigame. Not exactly the best way to do it, but the info is at least semi-important. Most of the text is stuff we already know, like how the machines are imitating human emotions. But weirdly, when the machines fail, they just do the same thing again. So if one were to establish a dictatorship would fail, they would just start it up again the same way without ever learning. Which is a nice commentary on how history often repeats itself no matter how many times we learn about it. This minigame shoots us right to when Adam dies, so we are really light speeding our way through the chapters now. Due to his critical condition, 9S is then sent into the bunker for repairs, and it's here where we learn one of the biggest revelations in the entire game. 
When accessing the bunker's records, he discovered that many of the containers sent to the moon are empty when they should be full of supplies, and that the Council of Humanity was a directive created by Yorha when it should have been the other way around. The commander eventually comes clean and says plainly that humanity is extinct, and it has been for thousands of years, far before the aliens even arrived on Earth. So humanity was never on the moon, and the humans never fought the aliens as they died before they even showed up. The biggest question, of course, is how is that possible? Well, to explain, we have to go back to Near Replicant. But that requires us to talk about the final boss and lots of endgame spoilers, so just in case this video has piqued your interest in Replicant and you'd rather play the game for yourself, then skip to the time on screen. Assuming you would like to continue, then strap in, because the reason for humanity's downfall is actually rather comedic, as it's all our fault. For a brief recap, humanity was dying from the white chlorination syndrome brought on by Kaim and Angelus' fight with the Queen Beast. This led humanity to create Project Gestalt, an experiment that would separate a human's body and soul so that they could live on while the rest figured out a cure. These yellow and black shades, as the game calls it, are the souls, and the human bodies we talk to in the game are the bodies of those souls. The plan failed when the replicants of the body started gaining a consciousness, becoming more than just a shell. This resulted in the soul, or shade of that body, to relapse, causing them to lose their sapience and be nothing more than a mindless creature, while the replicant, or the body, would develop the Black Scrawl disease. The main protagonist of the game, Nier, is also technically the villain. As in the opening moments, we see him defending his sister Yona from the shades before using the power of the Black Book to gain magical powers. This eventually split his body and soul like the rest, but due to his power he became the Shadow Lord, the leader of the shades. The Shadow Lord is the soul version of Nier, while the main character after this is the body version of Nier. So the protagonist and antagonist are the body and soul of the same person. Due to his overwhelming power, the Shadow Lord was able to keep the Shades in check. But thanks to Nier killing him at the end of the game, the Shadow Lord lost his grip on the Shades, causing the Black Scrawl and Relapsing to come back. This is actually one of the major plots within Replicant, that not only are we killing humans, since the Shades are the souls of the humans, but that we're also technically the villain. Although to be fair, a large part of Replicant is that villains aren't real, it's just that people are doing what they can to survive and save the ones they love, as both the soul and body version of Nier did what they did to save their sister Yona. As a result of the Shadow Lord's death though, humanity eventually died out over the course of the next thousand years, so the bodies and souls all perish, leaving nothing behind. However, the androids were created before humanity died out. Devila and Popola, two people I'll bring up later, were the game's one and only androids, as they were created to oversee Project Gestalt. So androids did exist back then, which is important as eventually aliens invaded, but many of the androids started hearing rumors that humanity was dead, causing them to lose morale. So a few androids who knew the truth got together to create Yorha, who then created the Council of Humanity to give off the impression that humanity was still on the moon, waiting for the androids to finish the war for them. So Yorha was created to be alive from the get-go. Humanity died out years ago, and they were never there for the fight against the aliens. So to recontextualize our timeline at the beginning of the video, the humans didn't overcome the white chlorination syndrome. It killed them and the war wasn't humans and androids versus aliens and machines, it was Emil and the androids, as we know that Emil cloned himself to help fend them off. Humans never played a role in the war at all as they were never even there to see the start of it. It's easily the biggest revelation so far and explains lots of the weird behavior during the game, such as why we never see the faces of the council and why their messages were so stiff. When asked why she was willing to divulge this info so easily, the commander says that no one fights without a reason and that they need a god worth dying for. Relating back to the entire theme of the game, creating a false statement that humans were alive gave the androids a purpose to live and a reason to die. Just as humans see our creators as gods, humans are the creators of the androids, so they saw humanity as gods. And it's because of this fascination with them that the commander and the others who knew the truth spread lies about humans that the androids had a purpose. As without the idea that they were fighting for humanity, they would both let the machines trample over them since it wasn't worth fighting anymore, and they would also lose their lives and home in the process, something Yorha is trying to prevent. So instead of the machines, who forcefully created their own purpose due to their own actions, androids are falsely given a purpose that they don't know is already gone. Something you may have noticed though, or at least thought about, is Yorha itself. The bunker is one of the only places in the game with this monochromatic look. And according to Yoko Taro, this was meant to symbolize how lifeless the place is and how it's eventually going to cease existence. The outfits worn by the Yorha soldiers is also a nice touch, as each member either has a mask or blindfold on them, referring to the three wise monkeys. See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil which in the case of Automata, means how each of the Yorha troops are being deceived and not being told the full truth. To add to this, there are only two people who know the truth, or at the very least know that Yorha is corrupt, and there are also the only two individuals without something blocking their eyes or mouth, who are the commander in A2. So maybe her command was the one who betrayed you line, might have more meaning than originally thought. Then finally, to wrap this whole section up, the very last instance of new content comes at the very end of the fight with Adam, where when 2B is choking out 9S, we can see two girls in red dresses watching over them, while not important, these two will appear soon, so it's an attempt by the game to foreshadow the upcoming storm. 
Overall, Route B is a solid piece of content, and should hopefully explain why I prefer to call them routes instead of endings, as these new revelations add more to the story, by either giving us other perspectives we weren't familiar with, or by outright changing the entire plot. It can seem very daunting to go through the whole game again with very little change, and that's still something I agree with, but I find that at least from a story perspective, the struggle is worth it. Route B might not provide as many opportunities to engage in philosophical discussions as Route A, but it was never meant to as it was intended to be an addendum to the previous route, giving us more context to our actions and explaining things that the original route may have left untouched. One thing you'll have noticed about Route A and B is that so far outside of the philosophical discussions, the story has been quite basic. Androids are the good guys, machines are the bad guys, androids defeat the bad guys, and that's it. Roll credits. It's the template for a very generic action movie, one that may be centered around the action and not so much its themes, which is why Nier Automata following suit is rather strange. That's because the game was holding its cards until they were ready, as we're now given access to Route C and D, which not only come with seven additional chapters, but it's where the story starts to take a turn. If the first two routes were all about providing the player a sense of normalcy and comfort, then these routes are all about tearing that fairy tale down. Before that happens, the game attempts to attract the player's attention by giving them a preview of the events to come. I'm getting a lot of Phantom Pain flashbacks here, and unfortunately they share more similarities than just this inclusion, as like the second half of Metal Gear Solid V, Routes C and D are where things start to go south, fast. It starts with 2B and the rest of Yorha getting new outfits as the group is pulling out all the stops to finish this war once and for all. The operation goes off without a hitch until a large-scale EMP affects all the Yorha members, followed by a logic virus which infects them right after. This is something we saw with 9S earlier, and now we're seeing it once again. Thanks to 9S's hacking, he and 2B are able to quell the effects of it for now, but seeing as their entire army was just infected, they need to tell command, but the connection isn't working. So, in an admittedly smart decision, they blow themselves up again and then transfer their minds to a body of theirs in the bunker. Sadly, the rest of the bunker has also been infected, including the commander, leaving 9S and 2B as the only members of Yorha left. So it's already been less than 30 minutes, and already Yorha is gone. Like I said, things go south pretty quickly here. Yorha isn't the only one who's nearing the end though, as 2B gets attacked during her ascent to Earth before the virus comes back and disengages most of her systems. She then has to crawl all the way to the mall, only to be saved by A2, but if the white and black colors didn't give it away, something is going to cease existence soon. And it's not A2. To be. To be. To be! Are you? A2 kills 2B to stop the logic virus from spreading, but from 9S's perspective, 2B was murdered. It's a pretty heartbreaking scene, especially since this is the first time 2B calls 9S 9s and meant it. It goes without saying, but it's yet another gut punch for the game this time with more emotional weight behind it. 2B is the protagonist of the game and the one you'll likely spend the most time with, so it's understandable that this moment hit a lot of people hard, including myself. She was just able to accept the side of herself that she repressed, and now won't be able to see it flourish due to her death. Her and 9S's relationship seemed to be advancing quite steadily as well. One of their talks was about going to a mall after the war to go shopping together. And within each weapon is an item description which uncovers more story the more you upgrade them. As someone who's dabbled in a few item descriptions from time to time for a video, this was a nice trip down memory lane. But two of the weapons, called Virtuous Contract and Cruel Oath, are the default weapons of 2B and 9S. Each one seems to be written from their perspective, and while 9S's is about his past, 2B's is about her wondering how long she can keep fighting and protecting the one she loves. She cared just as much about 9S as he did her, and honestly, a shopping trip sounded rather nice. From here though, the player is given the chance of playing as either 9S or A2. Both of them have their own set of chapters, and you'll be forced to do them anyway, it just depends on what order you want to do them in. So, seeing as she's finally given more than 2 seconds of screen time, I think it's only fair we start with A2. A2, like the others, is an android, but is an older model, which might explain why the logic virus didn't affect her and why she seems to be one of a kind. Her backstory is also quite unique, as she was deployed as one of the first Yorha models along with a few others and were tasked with defeating machines at a specific location. Along with them was an operator who was tasked with monitoring these soldiers so they can use their data to make more effective advanced models like 2B. It seems like Yorha expected all these models to die for the sake of combat data, but A2 was able to survive thanks to the operator saving her. Given that she was a rare model and knew the nature of the mission, she was ordered to be killed by the other Yorha members so the truth wouldn't get out. 
So, as expected, she isn't a murderer, but someone who is betrayed and slandered. Due to this, she has been on her own ever since, and has developed quite the rude attitude towards pretty much everything, mouthing off at anyone and everyone that speaks to her. This also extends to the machines, including our lovely friend Pascal, who probably would have been stabbed immediately by A2 if it wasn't for us controlling her. Similar to 2B though, A2 eventually starts to warm up to the machines by interacting with them. There are also a few unique side quests involving A2, one of which has you building a slide for the kids at the village, all of whom are extremely grateful and even call her Big Sis. A2's rough outer shell slowly starts to chip away the more she interacts with the village, and she honestly comes to enjoy their company. If only this game could have a happy ending once in a while. As Pascal's village will be overrun by the logic virus, so A2 has to deal with the rampant machines while Pascal gets the children to safety. Not many of them can be saved, however, requiring us to kill most of the village we've spent a couple dozen hours help thrive. Not to completely switch the tone of this dramatic scene though, but I did find it extremely funny that the only living survivor of the village that wasn't taken by Pascal is this kid in his room. He's from a 9S specific quest where the kid keeps locking himself in his house because he's scared of the outside world, and then vows at the end of the quest to be the world's best shut-in. And since the door can only be opened by 9S, he becomes the one surviving member of the village, proving that you should never leave your house and stay inside for the rest of your life. That aside, both A2 and Pascal decide to meet up at the old factory and set up shop there, but the machines seem to have found them. This leads into a pretty difficult fight, but thankfully watching our back is Pascal. Yeah, the pacifist machine renounced their oath in order to protect the children. Which goes to show how much Pascal cares about them, and it's that part in particular that really stings the most. <laughs> All of the kids have died, or more specifically, they killed themselves. Pascal taught them emotions and feelings in order to prepare them for the real world. One of those emotions was fear, so that the children didn't just run headlong into danger. But it didn't seem like Pascal taught them how to cope with fear, as they figured the best way to resolve this terrible feeling was killing themselves. Pascal, in the midst of breaking down, asks A2 for help. He can't bear the thought of his memory haunting him for life, so he asks her to either kill him or to wipe his memory. The question that's at the core of this is whether or not something is worth giving into or avoiding entirely. In a less deadly example, this harmful memory is no different than a breakup. You don't want to live with the memory, but you have to. The best way to get over a breakup is to understand that what happened happened and then move on. That's easier said than done, of course, but it's the only way. Pascal can't find the strength to carry on due to the severity of the act, but to me, staying here alive is the best outcome. Which is something you can choose, as a lesser known third option is simply walking away. Pascal won't be heard from again, but I find this to be the best outcome. Whether or not they are able to move past this horrific moment is uncertain, but what he chooses to do as a result should not be my choice. Taking his own life or wiping his memory should not be my own choice to make, as it's not right to take away someone's final decision. Leaving means that Pascal isn't heard from again, killing him obviously kills him, and wiping his memory makes him return to the village, adding how calm this new place he discovered is. Pascal has no idea that this was once his village, but given what we know about the machines, it's safe to assume that Pascal might start the village up again, since all machines tend to repeat their past actions. That is definitely the more palatable of the two binary options, but then we can do a deeper discussion about whether or not this is the real Pascal and if there's something that should have even been done in the first place. Plus, he ends up becoming a merchant and selling you weapons you can only get through him, and they seem to be assembled from the parts of the dead children, which is pretty creepy. Still, this is a very traumatic moment for him, and I find that not embracing that moment, reveling in all of its emotions, but instead avoiding it, is only going to make it worse. It's not really a great outcome either way, but the faster he can recognize that what happened happened and that nothing he could have done would change the outcome, the faster he can move on and start anew. Near Automata in this second half is really pulling on the heartstrings, as most of the characters we've come to know and love are dying right in front of us. Pascal's village definitely hurt the most, as they're just a small group of peaceful machines that got caught in the crossfire. And at this point in the playthrough, I literally just built that slide for them too, and now all the kids calling me Big Sis are dead, right here on the cold factory floor, thus signaling the end of A2's chapter. While A2 is busy doing this, 9S on the other hand is saved and wakes up after falling off the bridge due to the large tremor, which spawned a massive tower right in the middle of the map. When accessing the tower, a voice on the intercom tells us that we can't enter until we access the three pillars next to it, as well as a prize being given to the winner who makes it to the top first. This requires us to head to these large resource units and grab the keys located at the top. The units seem to be a massive resource collector that the giant tower will use to then craft more machines. During this, 9S also gets a pretty important side quest he can tackle, which sees him gathering mementos of an android's fallen comrades that he can mourn their loss. Seeing this brings 9S to do the same, and will place a stick and a blindfold in 2B's honor. 
While this could be seen as 9S getting over his grief, that unfortunately is not going to happen, and is arguably the sole motivator behind his current manic state. As despite his pod's assessment, he refused to get repaired and wants to keep going far past his limits. He is completely hellbent on not only killing the machine in his way, but also killing A2 for what he did to 2B. From here on though, the player is going to be switching off between A2 and 9S at certain points, as they are roughly a few feet away from each other at all times. But once all the keys are found, the tower can be open. 9S attempts to get in, but the hack takes too long. Lending him assistance though, are the twins Devola and Popola. These two, like Emil, are characters from Replicant, and also have appeared quite a bit throughout the story already, but I found it easier to summarize everything all at once. As I mentioned earlier, Devola and Popola were two androids created to oversee Project Gestalt, but thanks to Nier and company, they failed in their mission. This Devola and Popola are not the same ones from Replicant. Like all the androids, they're the same model, but not the same exact ones. According to them, there was a Devola and Popola unit stationed at key areas all across the world, but the twins from Replicant were the ones that failed. This caused the twin models to be discontinued, with the ones still alive being implanted with a device that wiped their memory and gave them constant feelings of never-ending guilt, including our twins. After the collapse of the project, they scoured the land for days hoping to find residents at different settlements, but everyone turned them away thanks to what their other models failed to do, so they're basically being blamed for the actions of their sisters. This ultimately ends up leading to their deaths, as when they eventually arrived at their resistance camp, they were given all the crummy jobs nobody wanted, but they did them anyway since they felt like they needed to atone. And them defending 9S is another example of them atoning, and while they did succeed, it seemed like it cost the two their lives. This particular moment once again locked me in for another ride in the emotional roller coaster. Not only did I enjoy Devola and Popola in both games, it's honestly quite sad to see that they died atoning for something that wasn't even their fault. Yes, they're the same model, but each model is arguably a different person even if they look the same. So them dying here while Valiant is actually rather depressing, as they live their lives thinking they failed everyone, when in reality they did nothing wrong. Eventually, 9S will make it towards the top and get surrounded by a dozen 2B models who are trying to kill him. 9S sees no issue in this though, and actually revels in the idea of killing her. Whereas 2B went from emotionalist to emotional in Route A, 9S has gone from lighthearted and optimistic to full-on edgy nihilism. It's hard not to understand why though. The kid just learned that their gods are dead, Yorha was lying to him the whole time, and all the soldiers he worked with are dead along with the girl he clearly loved. After that, what's the point, honestly? Why bother caring anymore? He's got nothing left to live for or to fight for. It's why I think the owners of the tower who are the Red Girls are doing this to him on purpose as they want to break him, while also watching from the sidelines just to see how far they could push him. Yes, 9S has done a complete personality change, but it was handled exceptionally well, letting it ease out over the course of the route to make his more sudden change believable. All throughout this route though, the player has been possibly finding breadcrumbs of information, and this, coupled with what 9S is about to learn right now, manages to somehow once again change your perception of the game. The first was that there was a classified plan to destroy Project Yorha. The plan was to have the bunker be attacked by machines who would blow up the bunker, along with all the evidence it has, including this archive. This is supposed to ensure that the androids on the surface never discover the truth about humanity, and thus continue to fight the war against the machines. The other piece of info says that the black boxes within the Yorha androids are made up of similar material to that of the machine cores, meaning that the consciousness of the androids and machines are the same. This is where things start to get a little confusing, and actually quite annoying if I'm being honest as each of these files has level SS confidentiality, stating that no one, not even the commander, can know of this info. But that begs the question, if the commander doesn't know, then who's higher than her? Well, many point to two individuals named Number 9 and Zinnia. These two are never mentioned in the game at all, and only briefly referenced in a stage play and multiple voice dramas released post-launch. Apparently, they are the original creators behind the Council of Humanity and Project Yorha, and these documents explain their plans. It's a nice piece of info to have, but I feel like some references to these characters in-game would have been nice. I've long since said that important info like this should always be put in the game and not side material, especially if the series starts from a game and is not an adaptation of a book. And while I can understand wanting to use different methods to convey certain plot elements, these two characters not even being mentioned once in-game is a little strange to me. So instead of talking about two figments of our imagination, let's instead talk about two characters who actually exist, the Red Girls, also known as N2. According to them, they are the ego or personality of the machine network, basically a physical manifestation. They are the main antagonists of the game and are the reason for most of what goes on during the game, especially during this route. After killing off the aliens, the machines were lost and without purpose, as their only directive was to defeat the enemy. So N2 here decided that they could keep their objective as long as they never complete it, and in the meantime would then use the androids to evolve. As long as the war keeps going, each group is going to get stronger and stronger. The androids by building better androids, and the machines thanks to them eating those androids. Well, they realized that if they killed off the androids in one, then they wouldn't have a purpose anymore. 
along with them not having any easy source of nutrients to eat that would allow them to evolve. So they continue to perpetuate the war, likely until they can't evolve anymore. This is also an answer behind some of the deficiencies within the network, and why some of the machines chose to leave the network, like Pascal and the Forest Kingdom, as they believe that doing this would allow them to diversify their evolution. This doesn't seem to imply that Pascal and the Kingdom's actions were not their own, but their choice to leave the network seemed to be controlled by the Red Girls. What they did after was done without the girls' input. The girls telling the Forest King and Pascal to leave though does bring into the discussion about whether or not any of this was truly their own. It seems like what they chose to do post-removal was their own choice, but it's kind of like putting your essence before your existence. Within the network, they were told to kill, and while they're free to do what they want out of the network, they were instructed to leave, so can it really be said that what they're doing is their own will? I personally would like to think so, since the Red Girls don't seem to have a hand in their endeavors, but that seemed to be the point. They wanted to be involved by not being involved, if that makes sense. It doesn't make Pascal or the Forest King any less human or interesting, but it does beg the question of whether it can be truly called free will if this is what the network wanted. Somehow more shocking than this is info about 2B's real name. To be or not to be? That is the question, as 2B is not 2B, but rather 2E. We haven't talked about this yet, but the Yorha androids all have a letter and number attached to their name, but their letter means a specific class. 9S is a scanner or S-type robot. The E is an executioner class. Androids within Yorha who specifically killed deserters and betrayers of the organization. But Tubi purposely had her class hid, because unlike the others who would just be assigned to kill any android, Tubi was only allowed to kill one. 9S Apparently the 9S type model is very proficient at discovering the truth about Yorha and humanity being extinct. So 2E models are designed to work with 9S models, and then kill them when they get close to finding out the truth. Surprisingly, much of this was hinted back as far as the first mission as 9S asked why a combat unit would be paired up with him since scanners usually work alone. This also might explain why 2B constantly tells him to keep his emotions in check as opposed to everyone else, since letting him get curious would eventually lead to his death. In addition to this, when investigating the body records in the bunker, the storage of 2B is marked with a Y or yes, implying that her body is in there, but that can't be possible since she's on the surface, hinting that 2B's real name is not 2B. There was also a brief conversation during a section with A2 where it says, Normally we'd call you blank, but instead we'll call you 2B. And most notable and depressing of all is when 2B kills 9S at the end of chapter 10, she says it always ends up like this, possibly implying that she has killed 9S models many times before. Judging based on what we know, it seems like 2B doesn't know what info 9S is actually finding as she never mentions anything odd about Yorha or the Council of Humanity. Which I'd argue actually makes this worse, as it seems like she was just told one day to kill him and yet despite not knowing why, does it anyway. I guess that kind of explains her cynical by-the-book attitude. Better to just not question orders and keep your head down, rather than let all that pain get to you. Sadly for 2B, 9S is a chatterbox and constantly tries to talk to her, which I can't imagine feels good, knowing she'll eventually have to kill him again. Weirdly, it seems like 9S might know this. The last fight at the end of the game seems to imply that 9S knows about 2B killing him all the time, and the game seemed to be hinting at this before the big reveal. When walking through the resource units, 9S ends up getting hacked and sees that it's trying to rip his memories of 2B away from him so he has to defeat this thing hacking his systems, only for it to be 2B. It's not actually her, mind you, but it just uses a neat method of symbolism, as he says, These are my memories and you can't take them away from me. Something that could be applied to both the machine he's fighting and 2B. To add to this, when 9S went missing for those 8 hours and found all those records on the machines, Adam ends up intervening and says, You're thinking about how much you want to blank 2B, aren't you? Initially, I just thought this was calling out every horny person playing this game, but that four-letter word could also be kill, referring to how much 9S wants to kill 2B for taking his memories from him. That is mainly just speculation on my part though, but if true, I find this reveal to be even more compelling due to how many times this was hinted at. That last fight I just mentioned though is about to happen right now, as eventually A2 and 9S make it to the top and talk about the info I just relayed to you, leading to the final choice. What do you know? You don't know anything at all about us! Proposal. Cease combat. Fighting her at this point would be a Pod 153. And... I order you to halt all logical thought and speech. This order shall remain in effect until you confirm the death of either myself or Unit A2. We must now make a choice. The old friend who's gone off the deep end, or the level-headed newcomer. Either option leads to an ending, but does require you to fight the other. 
Realistically, I feel that A2 is the correct choice. 9S is not in the right state of mind to be making any grand decisions, so I would have picked A2. She wants to destroy the tower since a rocket is being aimed at the moon and plans on destroying the human server on the moon. 9S doesn't care and sees everything as pointless. Humanity is extinct, androids aren't needed anymore, and Yorha along with all the data was going to be destroyed as well, so why bother? 9S also says that her killing 2B is the only reason he needs to kill her. Which, on that note, this whole route employs quite literally my least favorite trope in any medium ever, and that's the lack of communication. A2 goes the whole route without ever telling 9S why she killed 2B, which could have saved a lot of headaches in the future. To be fair to the game, they only meet three times, and the first two have 9S falling, which feels a bit forced, but at least they considered the idea. A2 does have time to throw out one sentence though before he falls, and she decides to tell him that 2B wanted him to be a good person. Which, yeah, that's a fair thing to say, but from his perspective, it's more like, hey, remember the girl I killed? The one you loved? Well, I have her last words for you. It's no wonder 9S attacks her right after. I can respect her not mentioning it by the next time they meet up though, as by then 9S would have been too far gone, so nothing would have gotten through to him. I don't know if A2 lost her social skills having been alone for years, but I just think a quick 4 second conversation to clear things up would have been nice. But if that happened, we obviously wouldn't have had this dramatic moment, which is admittedly pretty cool, if a bit forced. If you choose A2, she defeats 9S and hacks into his mind in an attempt to repair his logic circuits by removing the virus. The pod then takes 9S away, while the tower crumbles taking A2 with it. The only cutscene that follows is 9S's sword and bag stuck in a rock. Not exactly helpful, but this seems rather fitting as A2 is continuing 2B's legacy. When she was killed, A2 took her sword, which contained her memories in it. So it's clear that she cared about 2B and wanted to do right by her, which is why she didn't want to kill 9S and instead sacrificed herself. Realistically, she's been a dead man walking since the first mission she embarked on. She has lived far past her expiration date and is almost in a completely new world, as all of her Yorha friends were the older models, ones that died out years ago. So this is her finally accepting her death and doing right by 2B. If you choose the other ending, both of them end up killing each other. Following this fight was supposed to be a rocket that would be launched at the moon by the Red Girls. While the humans aren't on it anymore, the human genome is, so destroying that would truly mean the end of human life. But instead they opted to turn the rocket into an arc. The girls saw people like our androids and Adam and Eve as unique individuals who live different lives. They saw them and started to question the meaning of existence, and then came to a different conclusion. Instead of shooting a rocket at the moon, they were going to turn the artillery into an arc, filled with the minds of the machines, hoping that one day it would land on some distant planet and bring about new life. Interestingly, 9S is able to see inside the arc right before dying and notices that Adam and Eve are there, yet despite seeing them harbors no anger or resentment towards them. 9S starts to question whether or not he hates the machines now, or if he even hated them to begin with. Adam then ends up asking 9S if he wants to come with, possibly implying that 9S will also be on the arc. Given that the cores of the androids are based on the ones from the machines, that could mean that he'd be able to join them. In fact, all the androids could join them by that logic, including our recently deceased trio. And while that is a rather sound idea, the game will not allow us to see that outcome. Mainly due to the game having its own plan for us. I mentioned earlier how there were five important endings in Nier Automata, and it's about time we talked about the last one. Once you complete both endings, the pods come back and talk about the deletion of the android's data. As laid out in the plan we talked about earlier, all your hide unit data must be deleted, meaning everything will be wiped, and 2B, 9S, and A2 will be officially gone. Not one record of them will even exist. However, one of the pods can't accept this outcome, and asks the player if they want to salvage the remaining data, even though completing this task would be impossible. If you accept, you are taken into another hacking style minigame, where you have to defeat all the devs contained in the credits. The first 10 minutes or so is honestly not too bad, but it becomes extremely hard when Square Enix appears on screen. Dying, however, will result in you... getting a message? Yeah, from another player named Vortex3164, who said, I did my best. One thing is for certain, rely on your own strength. So I continued on and died again, and more messages popped up, from all over the world. All of these messages are meant to encourage you to keep going, even though this minigame starts to become impossible, because alone, it is. After enough deaths, the game starts summoning other sprites, letting you control up to seven turrets at once. Each of these messages are from real people, and these turrets are other people's data, helping you achieve the final ending. See, Nier Automata ends in a very bleak way, with everyone we love dying in front of us. This ending rejects that. If you choose to continue this ending, you reject the fact that the story is over, and are willing to do whatever is possible to continue it. The devs want ending C and D to be the finale, but the players want more, but the only way to do that is to take the fight to the devs themselves. Shooting the team's names is us taking the fight to their product, and due to the message system, it gives off the idea that everyone, 
all the players of Nier Automata are coming together to fight the devs, in arguably the most important battle in history, as the result of this war will determine the lives of the characters we hold dear. It is without question, one of the best endings I've ever seen. The game constantly hounds you with the same message, asking if you want to quit, hoping that you will give up. But those messages from other players, players who have not only gotten as far as you, but have beaten the thing that is currently besting you, those messages are meant to give you hope, continually giving you a reason to keep going, to push forward, to not stop until you finally beat the impossible challenge. All of this is done without so much as a hint that this ending is actually possible. You have to die close to six or seven times before the other turrets start to appear, and by then some people may have already clocked out, realizing it's too tough for them. It's a beautifully told and well-conveyed ending as it brings the community together one final time. The song playing during this ending is also called The Way to the World, and according to Yoko Taro, the choir in the background is actually members of the dev team, almost like they're cheering us on, wanting us to defeat them. It is a perfect encapsulation of everything we've talked about for the past hour. All the characters in this game wandered around the world looking for a purpose, and some of them either achieved that or died in the process. Our purpose now is to give that time back to them. Beating this ending sees both pods discussing how they seem to have gathered all the past memories and parts from the group, which makes one of them question if it's just going to lead to the same outcome again. The other pod doesn't know though, it could lead to the same result as last time with all of them dead, but it could lead to something different. Ending it with, a future is not something given to you, it's something you must take for yourself. We are not given a predestined outcome, we create that outcome. The final part of the game sees the pods talking directly to the player, asking if you enjoyed playing, while also asking if you want to help someone in need. What this means that we could become one of the turrets in another game. But to do this, we have to make the biggest sacrifice a player can possibly make within a game. They must delete their entire save file. Everything you have done since starting the playthrough will be wiped, gone from existence. And by the time you're watching this video, my save file will indeed be wiped, because it's the right thing to do. It would be selfish of me to have gotten this much help, only to not pay it forward. Along with this is a message you can send to the players that die, encouraging them to keep going. I thought long and hard about this, and after about 20 minutes, I landed on, the world is rife with hardship, so believe in yourself. I wrote this because I wanted it to apply not just to the minigame, but to life itself. The world is going to throw some curveballs at you from time to time, but none of that matters as long as you get up. Nothing good in life ever comes easy, that's a saying I've kept with me for years. Whether it was in my early years of YouTube back in 2016, not knowing if the channel would ever take off, or more recently when I've been hitting the gym. I've always told myself this whenever I start to doubt myself, and this same saying can be applied here. The world can be hard, and achieving your goals can be equally as hard, but as long as you believe in yourself, believe that you can accomplish the thing you want, you will succeed. That's the kind of message I wanted to leave for someone, hoping that it will give that person enough hope to give the ending one more try. Nier Automata is a game with a tremendous amount of visual storytelling, and is easily one of the best games I've played in recent memory. Very few games have attempted the things Nier Automata does with its plot and themes, and even fewer have actually made it work. It's an absolutely beautiful game, filled with gripping emotional moments, intense combat, and flusher background lore as far as the eye can see. It's a game I could recommend with ease, as there is very little, if anything, actually bad about it. That is why I wrote the message and deleted my file. I want others to also experience this game for the first time, and if I can help even just one person, then I know I did the right thing. It's a pretty tough ending, but that's why I'm hoping mine and everyone else's messages can help those new to the game beat it. Because there's greatness on the other side of that hill, you should just struggle a bit to get there. Thanks for watching. Thank you all for watching today, and I hope you enjoyed. Playing your Automata was definitely a great way to start off the new year, don't you think? Currently I'm thinking about doing Returnal next, although there might be one of my strictly informative story explained videos out before then, but at least when it comes to analysis and opinionated content, I'm leaning towards Returnal as of right now. If for whatever reason something comes up and I have to pivot to something else, then I'll let you know. And if you turn on notifications, then you'll be updated via the community tab like I always do. Regardless, like the video if you enjoyed, and subscribe if you're new. Thank you to my returning viewers for coming back to another video, and take care everyone. Goodbye.